a very blessed Sabbath to everyone here physically and following on the technology. Welcome to you all. God bless. We thank God again for the privilege of worship, uh, whether it is here physically or virtually, we give God praise and we thank God. We've come through another week. All around us, we see the events occurring, pointing us to worsening conditions and reminding us of certain important things. Today, our subject is joint ears must stand in the gap, part two. Joint ears must make up the hedge and stand in the gap, part two. Must. Why? That's the important question. So, greetings and welcome to all. <clears throat> and we continue to pray to God for his mercies and to trust him and to cooperate with him in getting ready for whatever else is to come, including the final crisis. We shall pray and then read our scripture reading, which is the one we've been looking at, and go straight into our message. Welcome again. Greetings. Blessed Sabbath. God bless you all. Wherever you are joining us, UK, USA, Africa, Caribbean, and here, God bless you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary with the assurance that when we come boldly to the throne of grace, you will hear an answer because of your love and because of the sacrifice of your son and his intercession now as our high priest. We thank you and praise you for all of your mercy because we know or should know that we cannot survive in this hostile, sinful environment of Satan's government without your mercy and grace. We thank you that your mercy and grace comes because of the infinite, victorious sacrifice of your son and now his intercession in the heavenly sanctuary, whereby the four angels are holding back the symbolic winds of strife until your servants be sealed in their foreheads. As we continue to look at this subject, why the church must make up the hedge and stand in the gap, continue to teach us. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Our script reading is one that we should by now be very familiar with, Ezekiel, <clears throat> Ezekiel 22, 30 and 31. Ezekiel 22, 30 and 31. We can stand and read it together. Ezekiel chapter 22, 30 and 31. Kindly stand with me. Ezekiel chapter 22. 30 and 31. We will read at the count. One, two, three. One, two, three. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Therefore have I poured out mine indignation upon them, I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord. Be kindly seated. Now, here, the scripture tells us that God could not do a certain thing that he wanted to do, that is, deliver his people, unless he found a man, at least in his church, making up the hedge and standing in the gap. And you may say, well, is not God sovereign and all-powerful? 
brings us back not only to freedom of choice, but we're going to explore something of great importance. I'm going to throw a statement to you in a minute. So here was God waiting for a man to make up the hedge and stand in the gap in terms of deliverance. He could not deliver his people if on earth at least one member of the church wasn't standing in the gap making up the hedge. He couldn't. Therefore, since he found no man, he had to give up his people to the destruction which they had sowed. He returned their own way upon their head. That statement meant he allowed them to weep what they sowed. Is that clear? Okay. But it is not only so in matters of deliverance. We studied last time I was here, that I mentioned it this morning in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel 9, 2 and 3. Remember what we read? Daniel found out from the book of Jeremiah. Now Daniel was a prophet and he studied the Bible. We who are not prophets, do we study the Bible as carefully as Daniel who was a prophet did? He did not say I'm a prophet, so he should know. He studied Jeremiah. And what did he find out? What did he understand? That the time for the 70 year captivity was nearing and Daniel prayed and agonized that God's will would be done. So not only in deliverance, Ezekiel 22, but in prophetic fulfillment, Daniel 9. Are you with me? The prophecy couldn't be fulfilled if God didn't find a man to make up the hedge and stand in the gap. We also studied that God had told Jeremiah, this is the last message, that when the time was approaching, he, God, would lay it on somebody's heart to make up the hedge and stand in the gap so he could do his will. Remember the last message? Okay. So that is a prophetic fulfillment requires a man to make up the hedge and stand in the gap. A deliverance of God's people requires a man to... Make up the hedge and stand in the gap. How about doctrine and truth? Let's look at Isaiah 58, 12. Isaiah 58, 12. Isaiah 58, 12. And just in case you don't know, in the Hebrew, breach and gap is the same thing. A breach, a gap. Isaiah 58, 12. Let's read it together. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. Thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the paths to dwell in. In case you don't know, in case you can't see, it should be clear to you to understand that this is saying exactly the same thing as Ezekiel 22. God will have a people to make up the hedge of, in the false doctrines, to make up the hedge in the doctrines that was made by error, and to repair the breach or gap that was made in his law. So whether it is prophecy, or deliverance, or the damage done by false doctrine, God must have people, a man, to make up the hedge and stand in the gap. And here the prophet Isaiah says the time would come when the breach made in God's law would be restored. And it happened by people studying and praying. I said, wait, how come Sunday could be this popular day of worship when the fourth commandment says, remember the seventh day Sabbath to keep it holy. And as men studied and prayed, men under God made up the hedge and stood in the gap. So doctrinally, in terms of the law of God, deliverance, or prophecy, God requires a man. It would be better for his whole church, but God requires at least a man to make up the hedge and stand in the gap. Are you with me? You've had, you have clear Bible proof. So all down through the ages, in the, in, today is October 31. And we know, <coughs> we've come along uh, well, it is being chal I hear it is being challenged, but we, we are told that Martin Luther on this day in 15, which year it was? 
1517? Nailed the theses on the church door. So people are celebrating today as Reformation Day, 31st of October. But all through the long period of papal darkness, God found men, Huss, Jerome, Martin Luther, who by prayer and study were seeking to make up the hedge that the papacy had caused and stand in the gap that error and evil had caused. And he found those men. Martin Luther was one such man to make up the hedge in the gospel understanding and stand in the gap. Okay? All down through history. All right. Now I'm going to make a statement now. The church can do nothing without God. You agree? The church can do nothing without God. That's not hard to believe. Because St. John 15 says what? I am the branch. I am the vine, Jesus says. You are the branch. And as the branch cannot bear any fruit, except it is connected to the vine, you can do nothing without me. John 15, well known to us all. The next statement I'm going to make is this. We can do nothing without God, and God will do nothing except through his church. You pause now. You pause. We can do nothing without God. And God has condescended to work through his church, the divine and human cooperating. And God will do nothing. Look at how long we have delayed the second coming of Christ. God can't get up one day and say, I have had enough, I'm going to come. He has to wait until the harvest is ripe. He will do nothing except through his church. Listen to Wesley. God will do nothing but in answer to prayer, that's John Wesley. Listen to the spirit of prophecy. Prayer is the key in the hand of faith to unlock heaven's storehouse where are treasured the boundless resources of omnipotent steps to Christ. Page 94, paragraph 2. So if God has given us the key, and that is prayer, and God has given us faith, that's the hand, and given us the responsibility to unlock, will he take that responsibility from us? No. Are you following me so far? You agree or disagree? Pardon? Your question? Let me hear you. Yes. Okay, he needs the church to defend his honor because Jesus said, let your good works be seen before men that they will glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's only one text, there are many others. Okay, good. Now, the question we have to ask now is, why must God find a church or a man to make up the hedge and stand in the gap. And so now we begin. Open your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12. I want you to follow carefully. 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And verse 12. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 12. <coughs> 1 Corinthians 12, 12. Look at this amazing text. 1 Corinthians 12, 12. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body. What is Paul talking about before we read the last part of the text? Paul is comparing the human body with another body. Are you with me? Paul is comparing the human body with another body. Talking about the human body, he says, the human body has many members. We know that. Look at the organs inside that we can't see. The limbs outside, feet and hands and tongue and eyes and ears and nose and teeth to chew and mouth and feet to walk. All these members. And Paul is comparing that human body with another body. Are you following me? Okay. 
For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one, now comes the amazing statement, so also is, so also is, Christ. So Christ is the other body he's talking about. Why doesn't he say the church? Why does he say Christ? Because there is such a union between Christ and the church that in truth and in fact, they are inseparable. Let me give an example. You have a brain in your head. Okay? And if your brain decides that you are to walk down to the bottom of the church, can your brain get that done if your feet, if, the, if your muscles don't get you to stand up and your feet don't walk down to the bottom of the church? Answer me. No. So your head, the decision is made in your head, but your head will not do it except through your feet walking to the bottom of the church. Are you with me? The head has to function through the members as the human body. All right. Now, suppose your feet want to go down. Suppose your feet were able to want something. Just an illustration. Want to go down to the bottom of the church. And there's no nerve impulse coming from the brain. Could your feet get it done? No. Let's move now to Christ. Christ is the head of the church. And Paul is, called, Paul is calling Christ as head and the church as body. One thing when he calls it Christ. That's amazing. Look at the verse again. So also is Christ. So when the head of the church wants something done, it is to be done through the members of the body. The members of the body can't get anything done without the head. And the head will not do anything except it does it through the members. Are we clear? Right or wrong? So Paul is showing us a deep mystery. Okay. Let's move on a little bit. Let's look at verse 27. Same 1 Corinthians 12. And he tells us there in verse 27, Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And verse 28, And God hath set some in the church, and now looks at the various members, some first apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles, gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversity of towns. And he goes on. We're looking at this mystery of the body of Christ. Christ and his body are one. Paul calls it, in verse 12, calls it all Christ. Okay. Now let's move now to something of great importance. Let's look at Colossians 1.18. We're moving gradually. I want you to follow and understand. Colossians 1.18 Colossians 1.18 Colossians 1.18 Let's read. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So, uh, as a matter of fact, go back. Go back, to, uh, go back to verse 13, Colossians 1, 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or principalities or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist or hold together, verse 17, and he is head of the body, the church. You got that? So whenever the head makes a decision, it is the body that must carry it out. The body can do nothing without the head, and the head will do nothing except through the members. Simi that is why God made the human body as, and made our planet as a lesson book for the universe. And you know, sometimes 
I hear people say they can't understand God. They can't understand a lot of terms. They can't understand Son of God, so they don't believe Jesus is the Son of God. They can't understand God, so they don't believe there's a God. And I say to myself, dogs have, in many cases, more sense than people. The man who was telling me so, he has a dog. The dog doesn't have a clue about this man's nature or where he came from, okay? Because a dog is a dog. But the dog is loyal to him. The dog depends on him to feed it. The dog will come and wag its tail and lap and uh, lick him up and so on. The dog doesn't have a clue about the nature of human beings. The dog can't even read or write. But the dog trusts and loves and obeys its owner. And God made us and animals on this earth to teach you the universe lessons, you know. So here, Big Shot saying, well, I can't understand God and creation. So I, if I can't understand it, I can't believe it. Remember of a little child who asked the man who was making such a boast, Sir, do you understand the mechanism of thinking and the biochemistry of thinking? Have you ever seen your brain and how it works? The man said, No. The little boy said, Well, then you don't have one because you don't believe in things that you don't see or understand. So it only shows the reasoning that people use to get away from God. God is infinite. We cannot understand all about him. We understand enough to trust him, love him, and obey him. If we were to understand God, it would mean we would, we would have to be God because God is infinite. And we feel so much about ourselves. We think we know a lot and so on. We are nothing. And the things we know, we, don't, we not, do not even know them as we ought. But we know enough about God. He's revealed enough about himself that we can trust him and know that whatever he does is for our best good. And that he's never the cause of trying to hurt us. Praise the Lord. Don't let our pets condemn us in the judgment that they were more loyal to their owners whom they didn't understand than we to God. At least we understand more about God than a dog can understand about a man. Simple little illustrations, but they help us to see how foolish human wisdom is can boast, that boast itself can be. Let us move on then. So Christ is the head of the church. Now, Paul now switches from head and church to marriage, Ephesians 5. He talks about marriage, and human marriage was to teach a, a, a bigger mystery, a deeper mystery, that from all eternity, God, God's eternal purpose, functioning through the fact that he foresaw sin would develop was to find and get an eternal companion for his son. Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5.23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the savior of the body. Okay? Is that clear? <clears throat> Everybody believes that? Wives believe that too? Husband is head of the, of the wife. Husband is head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church. And Paul doesn't state any conditions, he states a straight fact. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Whoa. Whoa. I think if we move on to the spirituality here, everybody will breathe easier. So let's move on to the spirituality. So the Paul is talking now about Paul is talking now about the mystical marriage, Christ and his church. And listen now. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Okay? That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he, listen carefully. That he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So this is now the wife of Christ, the bride of Christ. And Christ wants to bring it to the point where it is glorious, not having spot 
or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And he comes down now to say in verse 30, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones, verse 30. And verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So the church is the bride of Christ. And Christ is patiently working to bring this bride to the point where it is a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Why must he do that? Why must Christ bring the church to this position? Okay, we're coming to that. Coming to that. We're coming to that. Let's look at Revelation here quickly. Revelation 3, 21. Revelation chapter 3 and 21. Revelation 3, 21. Let's read it. Revelation 3, 21. And instead of him, you know the him means us individually. It means the church. Revelation 3.21, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Listen to the answer. The church, the body of Christ, is destined for the throne. And because she is destined for the throne, Christ must bring her to the point where she is without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, glorious and perfect, because she's destined for the throne. Are you with me? Well, well, what a high destiny. We are destined for the throne. And therefore, we must overcome as Christ overcame with the victory he gives us, but we must make that victory our own and overcome as he overcame. Praise the Lord. Are you still with me? Okay. Now, Let's look at 1 Corinthians 6, 17. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. I notice uh, something very important here now. We are now tying it together. Why is Christ and the church considered by the Apostle Paul as one entity? One entity. Like how your body is one entity with your brain and the rest of the body. Let's look at the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 6, 17. Things that we know but we're putting them together in a particular way. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. First Corinthians 6, 17. Whoa. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. We can read it as a sentence without the but because it's contrasting something above that we're not looking at right now. Verse 17. So leave out the but and we can read he. And we can read the church. He, she, the church. He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Whoa. You heard that? So the church is one spirit with our Lord, with our head. One spirit. That is a unity that is inseparable. Praise the Lord. And that brings us to an important conclusion. Since the body, Christ as head, and the church as members, since that body is one in spirit, and since God is preparing the body to be co-sovereign with the head on the throne of the universe, the body must be trained for her sovereignty. Because in the ages to come, we are going to judge angels. In the ages to come, we are going to be governors with Christ of the universe. So we must be trained for that queenly role. So all the trials and difficulties we over have to undergo, all the things that make us impatient and so on, okay? And I dare say, especially in marriage, just as, just as how Christ has to be, and so on, especially in marriage, we meet the, ch the very challenges that have to prepare us as a church for our queenly rule. You hear what I said? 
especially in marriage and the family, we meet the pressures that have to prepare us as a church for our queenly role at the top of the universe. Okay. Now, let's look at Romans 8, 14 to 18. We're moving step by step. I want you to understand some important principles. Let me add this. Christ and his wife have a joint account. Okay? Christ and his wife have a joint account. And both must sign for the treasures of heaven to be open. Christ has already signed everything in his precious blood at Calvary. He must find a man or a woman in the, in the church. He must find a church who will make up the hedge and stand in the gap by praying and agonizing to put our signature alongside his. And when that happens, prayers will be answered. Hallelujah. But if the church doesn't understand these things, these things and feel that God will rough over rough and bulldoze and dictate and doesn't understand that the body is one and when the head makes a decision it is the members that must carry it out we will not come up to the position of understanding and carrying out our responsibility to hasten the coming of the Lord by making up the hedge and standing in the gap whether it is doctrinally whether it is in terms of fulfillment of prophecy or in terms of deliverance. Is everybody with me? So we, we have to pray now intelligently. We are praying because praying is not just now something you do because you have to do, because somebody's telling you you must do it. We understand now that praying is putting our signature beside the signature of Christ on the check. To open heaven's storehouse. We understand that it is important for God to get things done. Because that is how he has chosen to operate. Even the angels have to understand the manifold wisdom of God by learning from the church. And if the church is careless in all of this and doesn't understand. You can understand how the angels are amazed. You remember, you remember that when... When the Jews were reluctant to go back down to Jerusalem at the end of the 70 years, the pagan king Cyrus was mystified and bamboozled. He said, imagine Daniel, you told me that before I was born, your God, a hundred years before me, through your prophet Isaiah, named me Cyrus to be the man to sign the papers to let the people of Israel go. And the very people who worship that God that you told me about now are not interested in going back down. So a pagan was made to begin to doubt by a church back then that did not know her responsibility. And so it is with us today. Are you following me? Romans 8. Romans 8. Romans 8, Romans 8, 14 to 18. Listen to the Apostle Paul, Romans 8, 14 to 18. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. We just read that if you are joined to the Lord, it's one Spirit. So if you are joined to the Lord and it's one Spirit, it shouldn't be difficult to be led by that Spirit of God, except that God is such a God of love and freedom. Now, when the brain tells the foot to move, does the foot have any choice? No. But God is a wonderful God. Huh? God tells us as a foot to move and gives us the choice, and we sometimes don't want to move. But then when we're in, in trouble, I want God to move, he must move. That's how we human beings are. But thank God for his mercy. He's a wonderful God. I said, Lord, have mercy on my soul. You are a wonderful God. So 
We who are joined to the Lord, the Bible says we are one spirit. It doesn't even say one in spirit, so you have any looseness in there. We are one spirit. Woo! Verse 15. And if we are led by the Spirit of God, that is evidence of our sonship. If we are led, look, if a man has a stroke, so the connection between the brain and the lower limb is broken. And you want that man to be healed. And the doctors are treating the man. And you are praying for the man. And the man is ultimately healed. How do you know that that man is healed from the stroke? When now, he can walk. When the impulse from the brain is now able to reach through the nerves, the muscles of the lower limb, and he can walk. So how will the world know that the church is one spirit with God? When she perfectly obeys the Father's will. That's the only way the church will know. Well, if a man has a straw and tells you he's seen and can't get up and walk, you know he's telling lies. And so if we tell the world that we are one spirit with the Lord and that we are not obeying his will, what will the world know? That we are telling lies. So Paul says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. This is the evidence of sonship. Verse 15, for you've not received the spirit of bondage, again, unto fear. So God is not a God that keeps us in bondage, you know. God wants us to obey him willingly and gladly and sweetly because we know that what he tells us to do is for our best good both now and eternally. For we have not received the spirit of bondage, again, to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Remember that famous statement, it is spirit of prophecy, which leads into another topic that we'll come to later on. We are told that the angels and Adam before the fall are sons of God by creation. Adam, the unfallen worlds, the angels, Adam before the fall, son of God by creation. We sinners are sons of God by adoption, when we are born again in Christ. But Jesus, the Son of God, is the Son of God by birth. And that brings us to that mis mysterious subject of the eternal Son. Another topic, but I just mentioned it there, because look at it. We have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, verse 15. Verse 16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Verse 17, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. So we have to suffer in order to be glorified. He suffered in order to be glorified. We have to go through suffering in order to be glorified. We are joint heirs. Now, you know what joint heir means? We are not equal heirs. We are joint heirs. In other words, Christ as heir cannot do anything except we agree and do it with him. Otherwise, we will be splitting the jointness. Hence, our responsibility to make up the hedge and stand in the gap for God's will to be done on earth through the church. And it's done by prayer and studying and preaching the word of God. Listen to me carefully and don't get vexed with me. It is not done by marching. It is done by praying and studying and preaching the word of God and leaving individuals free to join the body by faith. It is not done by getting the civil government to enforce the Bible on the masses. It is done by praying and preaching and witnessing and knowing that the church and the state are separate. Our husband is Christ. And we are never seeking to be married to another husband. The devil or the state. You still agree with me? We are coming into serious times and philosophies that will sound good and the ways to solve problems that the world will think are the only ways will catch a lot of us off guard who are not continuing to understand the issues clearly. So 
somebody asked me a question about a particular march, and I said this, do you feel if the government, for example, had announced that all stores are to be closed on Sunday and all sports, do you think the churches would march against it? The person said, of course not. I said, well, that means they don't understand church-state relations. For why should a man who worships on another day be forced to close his shop on the day of the majority, so-called majority traditional morality? You see, how, you see how things are? So I said, therefore, if they're not going to march, if they wouldn't march against that, any other march they're involved in, I have nothing to do with. Because you have to understand these issues carefully. Are you with me? Or Yvette? Okay. So notice what the apostle says. We are joint heirs. And as joint heirs, Christ will do nothing and can do nothing unless all the heirship agree with him and sign that paper by making up the hedge and standing in the gap through praying and submitting, receiving his righteousness and willingly obeying him. Praise the Lord. That's a serious responsibility. Okay. Now the Apostle Paul uses body the Apostle Paul uses marriage. The Apostle Paul uses airship. All these terms, you know why? This is too high for us to understand. So he uses all these different terms to get us to understand. Now he uses a building. Let's start at Hebrews. Hebrews 3. Some people thought that when the church buildings couldn't open, and therefore you couldn't come to a church building, that the church was interfered with. Well, Paul introduces us to the real church building. Are you with me? Paul introduces us to the real church building in Hebrews 3. All right? Hebrews 3. Let's look at verse 6. Hebrews 3 says, But Christ as a son over his own house. That's a wall house. Christ's own house is wall, board, or concrete, or mud. Whose house we are. Okay, so the members of the body who are born again and abiding in Christ, they are the house of Christ. Not a piece of concrete that you paint yellow or pink. The, look at it. The members of the body are the house. Uh, listen to how we are the house if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of our hope unto the end. People ask or challenge the investigative judgment. All the investigative judgment shows is verse 6. Whether you hold fast the confidence you had at the start right through to the close of your probation. Because the Apostle Paul says you are the house only if you hold fast the confidence and rejoicing unto the end. But look at, look, at, look at it now. Look at verse 4. Let's come down. Let's come down from verse 3. In fact, from verse 1. Hebrews 3 from verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Oh, praise the Lord. Let us consider him all the time. Who, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house? For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch that as he that hath built the house hath more honor than the house. For every house, verse 4, is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house, Whose house are we? Praise the Lord. So Paul uses the body. Paul uses the wife. Paul uses joint ears. And now Paul uses the building. Oh, praise the Lord. All this shows us our responsibility, who we really are. Okay? All right. 
Are you with me? All right, as our time is, I'm laying this foundation very carefully. Let's come now. Let's look at this unity a bit more. Let's come to St. John 17 now, and then we will move down to some important conclusions. And may the Lord move upon our hearts to make up the hedge and stand in the gap. St. John 17. St. John 17. John 17, 21 to 22. From what I have said so far, what we are about to read now should be as clear as daylight. John 17, 21 to 23. <clears throat> Let's go. John 17, 21. That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. Wow. Do you see the unity that God is talking about? Do you see the unity the church has with the Godhead in Christ by the Spirit? Do you see it? And since God cannot be divided, God does nothing but an answer to the prayer of the true church. And the true church must be in harmony with his will. And he will work through the true church to wrap up the great controversy. And it means, too, that we should spare no stone unturned in genuinely seeking unity in the body. That is also controversial. I don't know why, but it is controversial. We should seek unity in the body. All those who share our truths and are sincerely honest with the Lord they and us and all, all such should seek the genuine unity that Christ is praying for in verse 21. True or false? I hear an answer to that all. Verse 21 again. Why? Why, why is that important? That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So this unity of the church and the unity of the church with the Godhead in Jesus Christ by the Spirit. So God will have a church who that perfectly obeys his will, keeping the commandments of God, all ten, and the true Sabbath. We have to come back to the way the true Sabbath is the wedding ring, to use that term, is, is the sign of marriage between Christ and his church. We have to come back to that. But we'll come to it. Verse 22, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. Well, well, well. Look at this union. Look at how God looks upon the church. The glory God gave his son, his son has given the church. Well, when two people, two people marry, they have the same, same name, right? I see now this is the double barrel names that go. Double barrel names. But, uh, it should be one name. Well, things change, you know, but let me tell you something. The Bible says that the name of Jesus is Yahweh said Kenu, the Lord of righteousness. And it says that the name of the church is also Yahweh said Kenu, the Lord of righteousness. So it's Mrs., Mr. and Mrs. Yahweh said Kenu. One name. As soon as they get in double barrel, it is church and state. Church is to be married to one husband. Are you with me? And verse 23 now. I in them and thou in me that they may be made perfect and one. So the whole aim here is to perfect a church and make her ready for enthronement in the ages to come. What a God. What an eternal purpose. What love. Oh, we should praise him and thank him and cooperate with him every day. I in them and thou in me. Listen to Jesus. Jesus in us and we in him, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Wow. So this unity and this union, Christ, head of the body, is very important. And let's now move towards finishing now. Let us notice something very important. Let's look at uh, Matthew 16 now. Matthew 16.
We are proving everything carefully from the scriptures. Matthew 16 now. Matthew 16. I am sure if somebody were to give you a check for a million U.S. And is to have two signatures. And the person has his signature on. He's the source of the money. And he tells you make sure that you put your signature on it in the presence of the bank manager. You're going to keep that check very carefully. And make sure you put that name on in the presence of the bank manager. Because you want a million U.S. Remember the Bible says everything in this world is going to burn up. But you want the million U.S. And God gives us a check called the Omnipotent Resources of Infinity. Christ's signature is on it by his infinite sacrifice already. And he says, each of you, as a joint heir, put your signature on. That means you surrender all to me. You are born again. You abide in me. You pray to me. You agonize to me. You study my word. You make up all the hedges and false doctrine. And as your name is put on that blank, all the resources of omnipotence are yours. And I'm going to perfect you for your future queenly role. Oh, hallelujah. So look at this now, Matthew 16. Matthew 16, 15. Watch it very carefully. Matthew 16 from verse 15 right down to 19. And he said unto them, he saith unto them, unto them but whom say ye that I am? Because everybody was saying that Jesus was this or the next or the third. Verse 16. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. You heard that? The Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Are you following me? Verse 18 now. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, meaning the rock of Peter's confession, I will build my church. We come back to building. I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Oh, praise the Lord. The gates of hell coming with all sorts of false doctrine, false Sabbath, church, state union, all sorts of false doctrines. But God will have a people to make up the hedge. And we move every arrow and replace it with the truth of God. Stand in the gap. Agonize. Study and pray. The gates of hell will not prevail. No, that does not mean the gates of hell will not try to persecute us and put us in jail and send us to death, you know. But none of that will prevail against God's people and his truth. And listen now to this serious responsibility, verse 19. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom. To the church, God says he gives the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This is the serious responsibility of joint ears. You heard that? We are joint ears. So whatever decision is made in heaven, we are to carry it out on earth in God's way by prayer, study, proclaiming the truth, and obedience to his will. Let's move on as we come to the end. Let's look at John 20. John 20. Now I think when we see our responsibility, when we see our responsibility, we should do more praying and fasting, more studying, more consolidation of the truth, more searching, praying for deliverance from lukewarmness, Understanding how God has led in the past, the 1888 message, righteousness by faith, all the advancing light, and agonize for deliverance from lukewarmness and for the 
And for us to grow, we like to pray for the outpouring of the latter rain. In the Bible, in fact, teaches us that the rain of the Holy Spirit is a teacher of righteousness according to righteousness. So we should be praying to grow into the latter rain as we pray and study. But we are waiting for something to fall, and we are not praying or studying. As we pray and study, we grow into latter rain proportions. But we have to do this. We've delayed too long and the evidences are that we are now living in a midnight watch. This is an era of opportunity. It is not a date setting issue. It is an era of opportunity. Let me just turn back here to this uh, one. Let me just turn back here a minute to this quotation. Listen to it. Bible Echo. August 26, 1895, I've quoted it umpteen times. There are periods which are turning points in the history of nations and of the church. 1888 was one, for example. The end of the 70 weeks was one for Israel, for example. There are periods which are turning points in the history of nations and of the church. In the providence of God, when these different crises arrive, the light for that time is given. If it is received, there is spiritual progress. If it is rejected, spiritual declension and shipwreck follow. So praying and studying and receiving the light, that is how we grow into lateral maturity. Not doing nothing and praying for something to fall down. We are to pray and study and understand the times to which we've come. I am sure that this period of time in which we are living now is a turning point for the church and nations. But even the man in the street who doesn't believe in God says so. This is the turning point. Something decisive is about to happen and the people of God should awake to their responsibility as joint heirs, as the body of Christ, as one with him and spirit in making up the hedge, standing in the gap by prayer and study and accepting the light as he sends it being delivered from lukewarmness and growing from blade to air to be ripened from air to full corn in the air. Oh, we need to pray for and study for and submit for the outpouring of the Spirit of God by growing into that Spirit. All right, we're coming out to the end. So let's get back here to uh, the text we're looking at. St. John 20. St. John 20. St. John 20, 21, and 20, 21 to 23. St. John 20, 21 to 23. This is now after the resurrection. So Jesus told Peter before his death. Now he tells the church after the resurrection. Then said Jesus unto them, St. John 20, 21. Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, what? Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. You see the awesome responsibility the church has in the word of God, by the spirit of God, by the methods of God to do things. Wow. And uh, I want to tell you that God has given us a promise then as a church. Let's look at it in 1 John 5. Third last text, 1 John 5. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. As the body of Christ, as the house of God, I'm not talking about concrete, as the wife of Christ, as joint heirs of Christ. Listen to the promise God gives us in 1 John 5, 14 and 15. Let's read it together. And this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we deserve of him. And our desires will be given us of him so that what we desire are already the will of God. 
Look at Revelation 3.21, but we had that already. We are to overcome, and we are to have practice in overcoming. Now let me tell you something. Satan is a defeated foe. Satan is a defeated foe. He was defeated at Calvary's cross. And God has given us practice in defeating him in our daily experience because we have to pre be prepared to sit on the throne with Christ. So Jesus says, if you overcome as I have overcome, you will sit on the throne with me. And, it, and look, listen, Jesus has already overcome the evil one. So this is practice for us. Don't let Satan's roar trick you, you know. He's defeated. All right. And our last X, our last X, this is our end point. This is what we are allowing God to prepare us for. Revelation 19, 7 and 8. All heaven will rejoice. We will rejoice. Let's read it together. Revelation 19, 7 and 8. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife hath, I can put in a word here in the Bible, his wife hath at last made herself ready. I say at last because of how long we've kept Jesus waiting for the wife to make herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. May the Lord have mercy upon us. And may we make up the hedge and stand in the gap in truth, in righteousness, in doctrine, in the gospel, in deliverance from lukewarmness, in walking in the light, in being purged from all error and from all the ways of man and false religion and being united with Christ. For he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Our closing hymn is, To God be the glory, great things he has done. And his greatest glory will be in giving the church that victory to stand in the final crisis and to be victorious. God bless you. Six four seven in the church hymnal and three four one in the seventh day Adventist hymnal. Six four seven in church hymnal three four one seventh day Adventist hymnal. Glory.
get redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God, the bondless offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus upon Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory. taught us great things he hath done, and great or rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But pure and higher and greater will be, a wonder or transport when Jesus we Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, true Jesus, the Son, and give him the glory, great Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus we pray. Indeed, to God be the glory, great things thou hast done in Christ for us and to us. You've raised us from the guttermost to the throne of the heavens and made us joint ears with Christ his eternal bride, to reign with him in the eternity to come. So all that we have to go through is to prepare us for that role. Let us not murmur or fret, but endure. And let us pray and study and indeed make up the hedge and stand in the gap. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this Sabbath day. Be with us throughout the remainder of the Sabbath and the other messages to come. We pray that you will warm our hearts and continue to prepare us, keep us in Christ, keep our focus on him, accelerate our growth from blade to ear and ear to full corn in the ear. Give us more and more of your Holy Spirit as we search and study your word, as we pray and agonize. We thank you and praise you. Remember the sick in our midst, continue to be with them and lay upon us the burden to pray for them at home, that you will grant them healing. Be merciful to us. Prepare us. Save us. Deliver us from lukewarmness. Make us ready. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen and amen. God bless you. Real good.